Okay, so welcome for, uh, from our part two. My name is Kalle Happonen. <coughs> I've been working at CSC from five to nine years, depending on how you count it. Uh, I've been working on the clouds for last last four years, and I'm very little science, all cloud, and I probably don't understand what you do, but I can really maybe help you use the cloud to do it. All right, um, I'm Jukka Nouseonen. I've been working at CSC since August last year. Uh, as a system specialist doing DevOps, uh, technical support, and technical pre-sales of CSC cloud services. Uh, so, for example, if there's, uh, let's say, a project for sensitive data that requires a dedicated light path to our cloud, I typically am involved in arranging the connectivity and doing the discussion to that end in technical level, but also the cloud, cloud portions. So, to get started, AIA sent us some background information, but I'm not quite sure about your level of things, so how, just to target the presentation a bit, how many of you have used virtual machines before? That's a great number. Uh, how many of you have used virtual machines in a cloud before? Oh, that's Well, we'll try to get the rest of the hands up by the end of the day. Uh, how familiar are you with Linux and SH? Anyone use Linux and SH and command line? But okay, well, I think I can just stop here and thank you for the. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, maybe I'll try to deepen your understanding a bit. Uh, to start with, uh, Vera already touched this, but cloud has been used to describe tons of things. Anything from Dropbox to. Heroku to Gmail and everything is cloud. And the main thing with cloud is automation and self-service. Self and if you have that, you can call anything a cloud. What we refer to in our presentation is a bit specific, and I think only will refer to a bit different part of the cloud. So if you look at the, uh, the graph there, the second column is infrastructure as a service. This means basically you, you handle your own virtual machines and networks and operating systems and all of this. And this is where, where our presentation is going to be focused. And uh, I think all is going to be one step right from there on the platform as a service where you have a bit less to worry about and a bit uh, more out of the box. And we're not quite. But we're, we're coming. Uh, when we talk about research cloud, pretty much all of them are in the second column with infrastructure as a service. And this is probably what you're going to use in a lot of your trainings. Perhaps one additional gallop we could have here is uh, uh, how many of you are already familiar with these terms IAAS, SAS, PAS? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, this slide works perhaps best in Finnish because we call these like EAS, PAS, SAS. And uh, the creature on the left is an ass. If you're wondering. But it works also, it's an ass. Yes. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, but longer term, actually, I suspect you will be using everything up from infrastructure as a, as a service to software as a service in training and the whole full spectrum. But we'll be concentrating on the first. So. Uh, about our photo clouds, we've been running them now in production for over two years, and we uh, have been running them in pre-production for even longer, closer to three, four years. And it's your typical what you can expect infrastructure as a service. We use OpenStack extensively, and we're quite happy with it. It's a complex, it's quite complex, but a very powerful way of running your cloud. Uh, it's no two OpenStack are similar, so what you hear here is true of most OpenStack clouds and true of most other clouds too, but there might be small differences. There are tons of interfaces to the cloud, everything from web clicking to actually command line interfaces and actually then coding against the interface. So it's very powerful and the more, more you learn, uh, the more you can do with it. And we will try to take you down a few of these steps today. 
uh, we also have tried to target this offering to a lot of scientific use cases. I know that some of here are running specifically bioinformatics clouds, I think. Okay, nobody objected, so I assume that's true. Uh, but we actually run our clouds for all scientific disciplines and a lot of stuff around it. So we tr try to have an offering that actually uh, supports all of them, including high performance virtual machines, generic virtual machines, and we're coming up with IO intensive virtual machines soon. Anything else? Would you like to go through this one? Sure. So, uh, for this diverse set of hardware, we indeed have a fair amount of, of use cases. Uh, from anything uh, ranging uh, from high performance uh, clusters that you can utilize, of course, for, for biomed uh, stuff. We have a rather fast 40 gigabit network behind the nodes. You really need to uh, change information between the nodes in a fast manner. Uh, but you can also build uh, software stacks that may not be available on the CSC supercomputer plat platforms or CSC grid computation platforms. <laughs> so uh, the cloud, cloud gives you uh, added benefit of doing a little bit of customization on the software stack level that may not be there in uh, other services. Uh, then, of course, uh, a lot of things you can do in the cloud can be related to uh, development and uh, software-defined infrastructure. So testing out anything you're coding, just firing up a virtual machine and lost, launching an instance based on your code there and deleting it afterwards. So this rapid prototyping development of whatever kind of web service or a software that is analyzing some genomes and what have you. Uh, general purpose web servers and file servers are also possible to use in the CFO, the cloud, because uh, that is uh, directly connected to the internet. Uh, one use case that uh, we've been uh, looking into with uh, some uh, universities of applied sciences in Finland is this virtual computer class. So effectively on these computers we could have uh, virtual machine desktops that are running in Kajaani, a bit northern in the Finland, with negligible latency, so you would have a true like, virtual computer. Um, information sharing is, of course, also possible building some portal for uh, sharing data, for example, in the SQL cloud. But really, there's, there is no limit. So, uh, well, the Finnish law and the CSC, like, uh, CSC rules of use are, are pretty much the boundaries. And apart from those, we urge our customers to experiment, go wild. <coughs> Uh, here is just uh, a bit what we were talking about. Like, you really don't have to care too much about this, but we have different types of virtual machines, like standard HPC, which give you access to a large memory and normal oversubscribe. And then we're having the IO intensive compute nodes. For training, I assume you don't need super much resources, so you can <coughs> stay within the small things. And that's also good for us because our resources are well. <coughs> or properly used and not wasted too much. But this can be there for reference in the slide set. Yeah. So, yeah, basically the open stack thing is like, you manage your servers as you see, you can also manage networks if you need it. You can add storage to the servers as you see fit. For training purposes, not all of these are very important because you probably want quite simple environment, but all this is available. Uh, and as there are also such an important thing, this is pretty much only Linux. We can in corner cases give Windows access, but it is only Linux in almost all cases. So that's at least if we talk about a 20 training VMs, that's very hard to provide any Windows for that, so it will be Linux. But that's great because Linux is great. So, uh, and Another important thing, <coughs> with all this control, you have full control over your infrastructure with this, but this means that you have full responsibility of it too. If you screw up in your virtual machine by deleting something, 
we don't have access to your virtual machines. We cannot help you. You have to manage that. So you have basically control over the whole stack, but you also have responsibility of the whole stack. This also includes security updates, making sure that you don't have unauthorized access there, that your service is not used for spam, and all of this. Yeah. So how do you ensure that? You're by normal Swiss admin procedures. So it's no, like, I, I don't want to impose too much stress on you, but as long as you don't open any stupid, silly, <laughs> I'm sorry, silly things like write access from the web to the whole server so they can compromise the server or running a lot of unpatched, unpatched stuff. You don't have to take huge stress, but as, as long as you have a bit careful too. So my question is, do you run checks to see you know if there are ports open or something like this? Our principle is that you can. Yeah. Our uh, principle is that you can. We don't know what you need to do, so you can open anything to the internet you want. But for anything that <coughs> anything that is open to the internet, we will run security scans and just check, for example, if there are any known vulnerabilities or old software versions. And if there are, we will let you know. So these are, but of course we cannot catch everything. So some good Swiss admin practices are recommended. If you run a two-day training course, it doesn't really matter nearly as much if your virtual machine is only running for two days and then you take everything down because it's unlikely they have time to compromise even if they do, the damage is very limited because everything will be shut down. But this is then for longer term stuff you are running. Wrong computer. This is just a simple walkthrough of what I basically just did that shows you that you are in control. So basically you always talk to the cloud in server interface. For example, launch, launch a VM, done. Uh, this is a specific thing now that you will also learn in the afternoon. When you launch a virtual machine in our cloud, it has no access to the, in well, internet has no access to it. You have to give it a so-called public IP or floating IP and this is a publicly accessible IP address you can access the virtual machines from uh, and once you do you it's visible on the internet uh, you can launch, launch more machines manage storage do anything like this and use the and then you can only connect basically to the public addresses you give to the servers. If you want all your users to connect to servers, they pretty much all need uh, public addresses for your own thing. What we usually recommend is to have one server that has a public IP and then you use that to go to all the other servers in your network because they can see each other. But this is more of the than technicalities of good practices. As I showed, there are many interfaces. And one thing I would still likely, li likely like to touch upon is the different storage types. Again, matters not very, it doesn't matter very much for short-term course use, but for longer-term use it matters. So most, all the storage you get by default when you launch a virtual machine, everything will go away when you delete the virtual machine. You, if you have put some data there, you will lose it. So to avoid this, we have so-called volumes, which are independent from virtual machines and can, can store data for long term. You will be using them in the afternoon. And what I very much hope we will get in still around summer is a very typical service of cloud, which is called object storage, which is a very simple interface from on having uh, files stored at a web address that you can then just push and pull and it's uh, independent of any virtual machines and it's a good place to store a lot large chunks of data but needs to be accessed by many different virtual machines. Uh, what we don't have is a shared file system that is visible to the all, all compute nodes or all virtual machines. This is a quite highly requested feature but sadly it is very very hard to implement in a proper way that we are comfortable maintaining it it's secure 
and we have promise it's always there. So it's not there in a foreseeable future, but we'll see what we can do. But as I said, uh, there are many types. Uh, you, for now, you just have to be aware of this. You don't have to use all of them. And these are also good topics for discussion in the uh, let's say general Elixir story story arc. So we are rather interested on how you are storing your data sets, how you are manipulating them. Uh, is there uh, use cases for object storage in, in research that is being done in your organizations and so on and so forth? Because uh, files, they're getting a little bit old. So object storage may be better for many use cases. And it is much cooler because it's so modern. <laughs> Either way, what I just wanted to show you, which is also a base for that, is usually when people start using the cloud, they do everything the manual way, the so-called old way, not a modern way. So they start the machine, log in, do everything by hand, and then you have your stuff there. This it works fine once, but it doesn't work very well when you have to do it often. And while this is not completely true anymore in our cloud, but in most cases, if a disk fails, it's bye-bye. Do your manual work again for the 20 times you need to do it. Uh, it's also very bad for sharing this experience, sharing this environment, and a consistent environment. So we are very big into automation. And it's not, it is a bit difficult, it's not super difficult, but there, there are some tools we recommend. And this makes it so you can easily put up consistent environments in the cloud. And this is not very important for you, but this is our basically the most, this is more if you actually run real long term web services and stuff like that. But this is, uh, the actually really recommended tool we use, and I'm going to show you a small demo of it later. And then this is the... What you do? You'll do in the evening, hands-on exercises. It's not very much, and those of you who have used clouds might click through it in 15 minutes, but we'll try to get everyone there, and if you are ready, we have a lot of exciting things you can do in the cloud for training. So, I think... This is it for uh, us, if you don't have any more questions for now.